Stanford University. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Friday section of CS193P. We got our good friend Evan Dahlback to talk about iPad design, so I'm going to throw it off to him. Sweet. Thanks, Paul. Please, please. Easy. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> All right. So I'm here to talk about designing for the iPad today. Uh, we're going to go at this from a kind of thought experiment, philosophical point of view for the most part, but we're also going to talk about some specific uh, design choices that you might want to make when you're, when you're building an iPad app. So uh, my name is Evan Dahl. You might remember me from such Stanford courses as CS193P the last two times it was taught. Uh, I'm also a former Apple employee. I worked uh, at Apple for almost six years, three years on the iPhone, on applications and frameworks. And I'm currently uh, working at a startup here in, here in Palo Alto. Uh, and just to be really, really clear, I'm not an Apple employee. So everything I say here, it's just me. I'm just some dude with an opinion who, for some reason, is allowed to stand up in front of you and, and talk. Thank you, Al, uh, Josh, and uh, Paul, for, for having me. Uh, so I will be waiting in line outside the Apple store the night before the iPad comes out, just like you. Um, you know, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everyone else. So you know, there's really, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, uh, well, the iPad and design, obviously. Starting with uh, kind of how the iPad fundamentally changes um, a lot of what we think of as, as computing. Um, we're then going to talk a little bit about um, where a device like the iPad might fit on a day-to-day -day basis in people's lives and how you might incorporate some of that into your design thinking. And then finally, we're going to get into some specific tips um, for uh, designing great apps, some principles you might want to think about. Um, and just to clarify one more time, um, <laughs> I'm not an Apple employee. Uh, you, may, you may refer back to this slide if there's any, any confusion. Um, so, you know, I don't know any secrets. And we're actually not going to talk about the iPad SDK in any sort of detail today, other than the fact that it exists. Um, because of the way the SDK um, uh, agreement works, um, you're actually not allowed to discuss it publicly until it's been officially released, unless you, know, you can talk about it with other people who have all uh, accepted the, you know, the, the user agreement, but uh, not something that we can talk about in great detail in this venue. So that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, so let's get into it. How, in my opinion, the iPad changes everything. Uh, here's an obligatory photo, just in case you, um, you know, don't use the internet or haven't seen pictures of the iPad out there. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, some people have referred to this as a giant iPod Touch, which I will get into a little bit later and why I disagree with that statement. Um, but as you can see, there is a lot of similarity to the iPhone and iPod Touch uh, in terms of the, um, both, both the hardware and the software look and feel. Um, and I really like this quote from Alan Kay. He's one of the, you know, the forefathers of computing. Um, he, uh, back, you know, he, he, he invented one of the, the earliest sort of proto laptop tablet type devices call, called the Dynabook, like back before anyone even had any idea what, what these sorts of things might be able to do. Um, a total, total thought leader. Um, and when the iPhone came out, um, Steve Jobs came up to Alan Kay and said, so what do you think? Um, and Alan Kay said, you know, make the screen five inches by eight inches and you'll rule the world. So I think this is a, this is a nice sort of jumping off point for this, for this discussion, um, the kind of potential that something like this uh, brings to the table. Um, and this leads to our next big point, this newsflash. Computers are still too complicated. Um, it's easy to forget this, especially for those of us in this room or in this uh, campus, this part of the country. Um, those who, who design and build and write about and review computers are the ones who are most likely to forget that computers are still too complicated. Uh, there's, this, there's, there's this idea called uh, the, gul the, the gulf of knowledge, where basically the gulf of knowledge wrapped up in a, in a sentence is that the more you know, the less you know. So the more you are an expert um, on a topic, the more you are exposed to something and use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that actually hurts your ability to explain it to others and to uh, think about it in terms that you know people coming from your perspective, uh, who aren't coming from your perspective, are going to think about it. Um, it's a really, really difficult thing to overcome. So who falls into this category? You know, hackers, bloggers, tech columnists, and most likely you. I don't mean to pick on you. I'm not trying to harass you about being a nerd. 
Um, but you know, just those of us who, even if you just use a computer most of the day, as many you know, techie people do, um, you're coming from, um, from a point of view that many people do not share. So it's, so it's important to just realize that this is where you're coming from and um, use that as a jumping off point to maybe question some of your instinctive thinking about a device like the iPad. So keep this in mind when you're, when you're evaluating new technology. When, when something comes out and you look at it through your, your geek glasses and you say, well, it's really underpowered and I can't, you know, um, CH mod 755, whatever, um, you know, take a, take a step back and um, try to think about it a little bit more holistically. I'm going to talk about two specific attributes of uh, computing, which we all take for granted, we use every day, um, which we really should be willing to reconsider and think about uh, why they exist and how we might do without them. And the first one is, uh, is the file system. You know, every computer you've ever had has probably had a way of browsing the, uh, the, the file system hierarchy. Um, I liked a quote by John Gruber recently when, when the iPad was announced, and he said that on Mac OS X, uh, the system library folder contains 90,000 items, over 90,000 items, not one of which a typical user should ever need to see or touch or know about. And yet they're there. They're there for you to go in and delete and move around and accidentally drag your cat photos into you know, system library private frameworks. Um, all this stuff is exposed, and you know, maybe it shouldn't be. Um, this brings me to... One of my favorite computer users, uh, my mom, she's actually a fairly you know, savvy Mac user. Um, you should see her desktop. This is actually not her desktop, but I wasn't able to get her to screenshot it for me. Um, but you know, this idea of needing to manage what folders uh, your files are located in, we all take it for granted. But it's kind of crazy that, that we need to think about that. Um, to compare this to, to a device like the iPhone, where there is no exposure to the file system. That was a big knock when the iPhone first came out was that, uh, oh, there's no file browser. Like, I got to hack it and write my own. And that's great for a certain audience. Um, but for many people, it's just you know, not really something that's, that's important. The other uh, sort of fundamental aspect of computing that I want to you know, rip apart here uh, is the mouse. We all know the mouse, whether it's a trackball or a, you know, a laser whatever mouse or a, you know, a trackpad. Um, we all use mice every day. And, um, and because we're, we're techie people, we still like to have arguments about one button mouse, two button mouse, like your mouse sucks, my mouse is awesome. And uh, you know, we build things like, like this uh, mouse, which has, I think it's 17, 17 buttons. Um, because obviously, I mean, you need to be able to map that one up there to you know, some crazy command that like, does a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, this, is, this is the point of view that so many of us here in Silicon Valley or in the tech world come from. Um, and really, I would argue that despite the last 20 or 30 years of mouse usage all around the world, the mouse is a bug. It's not a feature. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we take for granted. We use it every day. But really, it's a very disconnected way to interact with our data. We're moving this one thing over here, and there's this other thing moving around on the screen. Sometimes it changes its appearance. Sometimes it hides. Um, and if you actually watch, you know, for a person who's using a computer for the very first time, and you don't get a chance to do that very often, but there is a lot of confusion about this disconnect between what you're doing over here and how that affects your content on the screen. And I think this is a really exciting place to, to explore, um, you know, just, just rethinking with a device like the iPad. Um, this takes me to your Stanford CS degree, whether you have it or already or not. Um, you know, I, I've got one too. It's awesome. But to, uh, to my family, this means that I'm the, the guy who fixes their computers. Um, you know, I go home, and I am emptying the trash, and I am cleaning up things that somehow got broken, and updating system software, um, helping figure out how to share files. And this isn't really how, how it should be. This reminds me of a, a good friend of mine who was a double major from Stanford in electrical engineering and economics. And, he was back home over, over Christmas break, and uh, a light bulb went out. And his, his mom said, I mean, you're the electrical engineer. He's like, you know, change the light bulb. Um, and it's, that's sort of like what it is for us to be these abstract you know, computer science thinkers. And it's like we're down there doing the plumbing, like emptying the trash. Um, but it, but it's, not just, it's not just a generation gap. Um, there are a lot of people who come at this from a different perspective. Uh, another good friend of mine his, uh, has uh, a BlackBerry, she doesn't have a laptop or any sort of computer at home, which 
to many of us seems crazy. We all have laptops and probably multiple computers, and we use computers wherever we are, at work and at home. But um, there is, it, it is possible to live in this modern world and not be a complete Luddite and not have a computer at home. Um, so I think it's valuable to think about why that might be for, for a lot of people out there, whether a computer, as we think of it today, makes sense um, when you're at home and you're doing things that don't involve Excel spreadsheets and CAD programs. Um, so it's a really, like I said, it's, it's an exciting time to sort of fundamentally rethink computing. And um, I think it really has the possibility to be the next big leap in uh, how we, how we uh, interact with computers. So this takes me to the second part of the talk. Do a little, do a little segue here. Um, where does it fit? Where does this thing uh, fit in with your daily life? The kinds of things that you do, uh, the places that you are, and uh, the sort of workflows or uh, you know, the actions that you're trying to perform. Um, I thought this was kind of kind of funny. Uh, these genes don't actually exist, but uh, you know, it, it brings to mind that this is not an iPhone. Uh, the, you know, the great thing about the iPhone is that everyone has a built-in carrying case in their pants all the time, and it's very convenient to take with you wherever you go. Um, the iPad is not like this, uh, so you may see that as a loss of, of convenience, but it can actually, uh, depending on how you think about it, could actually be useful as well. Um, if you think about some of the places where the iPhone is often used, uh, places like in your car while you're driving, um, at a restaurant, you're at a really fancy restaurant, uh, taking your significant other out for Valentine's Day and you know, you're checking your email, uh, at some performance or something, someone's got their iPhone out and they're like, you know, dorking around with it. Um, none of these work for the iPad. I, I would be hard pressed to imagine someone, I mean, I, I suppose, Someone will rig it, will, will rig it up, a, a sort of carrying case for their iPad that mounts to the steering wheel. But uh, this thing doesn't fit into every aspect, of every nook and cranny of your life, and that may not be a bad thing. So let's, let's talk about some places where I think it does fit really nicely. And the first one is while well, you're eating your breakfast. We all eat a breakfast like this every day. I know it's very just sort of, you know, we've got the four different, all, all, all the food groups. Um, but there is something really nice about sitting down over your breakfast and paging through the paper, or um, flipping through a book. It doesn't really work when you're on a, uh, on a laptop or on a desktop computer. You've got this like hulking piece of hardware sitting there, and you're kind of reaching over your toast and typing, and like you're eating something, and you like log in with one hand and type in your password. Um, there, there's something really nice about scaling it down a little bit and just having a device that's more meant for, for consumption, especially first thing when you wake up in the morning. Um, I think it, it, the iPad has a really great opportunity to to fit in nicely here. I think this is part of, part of why um, newspaper publishers, other publishers are really excited about the iPad. Obviously because you know, we need to save publishing and figure out how to pay for newspapers and all that stuff. But th this, this, this specific niche right here of uh, eating your breakfast in the morning is, is an interesting one. Uh, another place is you know, in your living room, sitting on the couch. Uh, if you're like me, you go home, you plop yourself down on the couch, you take your laptop back out of the bag, you start doing your thing. And um, I think the iPad has a real potential to, to change that and be a better fit for the types of uh, things that you're doing while you're sitting on your couch, whether it's controlling your TV, um, communicating with someone, playing a game. You know, maybe, maybe a full-on laptop isn't the best, isn't the best fit. Um, going later into the day, you've got some friends over, you're having a party, dinner party, whatever. Uh, if you've ever been to a so-called party at, at my house, you know that late in the evening, I like to break out the laptop, open up YouTube, and start you know, having a war of like, the funny cat video clips. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a real like, rockin', rockin' party. But um, I think it would be even more rockin' if I didn't have to enter my password, click, click, click. Oh, I've got my, you know, my, my Xcode document open. Hang on. It, like, takes, you know, it, it takes a little bit of the air out of your sails. Um, I feel like a device like the iPad could be a much better fit for these types of multi-user um, show and tell type interactions. And finally, I mean, there's, there's more places than we can really enumerate here, um, but I'm sure people will be thinking of really unexpected day-to-day um, -day situations where something like this makes a lot of sense. Um, whether it's you know, people walking around a hospital, uh, education settings, there's a lot of places where a laptop, for all of its you know, wonder and just like power, uh, maybe isn't the best fit. And going back to the, you know, the YouTube example, I mean, this really brings to mind 
laptops and iPhones can be very antisocial devices. This may be, this may be the, you know, the understatement of the lecture here. But uh, you know, whether you're using an iPhone and you're kind of zoned in on it and you're tapping away, or you're using a laptop and you're just totally focused in on it, it creates this, this cone of distraction where you don't really notice anything else that's going on. You're trying to hold, carry on a conversation with someone. I mean, everyone, we've all experienced this. And you're talking to them and they're typing on their laptop. And like, yeah, uh-huh, sure, whatever. And it, it, it's a very sort of socially isolating experience. Um, a device that's big enough for multiple people to look at and touch that doesn't have as much uh, you know, hardware attached to it, I think is really, is really interesting. It's a lot more open. It's a lot more inviting. Um, it's much more conducive to, to social, like I said, multi-user uh, interactions. Um, you know, Microsoft, you know, say what you want about some of their, their concept pieces. I think the Surface is really an interesting product. Um, the problem with it, obviously, is that it's large to the point that it's not really practical to take anywhere uh, you know, away from your, your coffee table. Uh, it's also expensive to the point that really no one would consider buying one. But this idea of having two people both being able to look at the same screen and interact with it together is really cool. Um, I, I see the iPad filling in uh, this sort of role in a lot of places. So multi-user interactions. What are, what are some specific examples of exciting multi-user interactions. Uh, the first one is presenter and view viewer. You're showing something to someone else. And um, unlike the, the laptop screen where you know, you're typing, and you're driving, and therefore the screen is angled right at you, and this other person kind of has to like, you know, get their head in there and try to look at it, it's much more conducive to kind of holding it out, tapping it around. I mean, it's, the iPhone works well in that regard, too. But it's just such a small screen, they've they really got to crane their head in to see it. Um, so situations where you're showing someone something. like. Apps that are designed not just for the single user who's using it, but that are designed for a sort of a presenter as well as the other people who are, who are looking at the app uh, are really exciting to me. Uh, this kind of segues into multiplayer games. I mean, I think this is going to be huge on the iPad. Um, being able to have some, uh, a device sitting at a table, multiple people can reach in with their hands and touch it, whether it's for a card game. I don't know if anyone here has ever played uh, the game Set. One of our students in, uh, in the very first run of, of 193P made set for, for the iPhone. But it was you know, a solo experience. And imagine if a card game like that was sitting on an iPad right in the middle of the table with a bunch of people all able to reach over and, and, and tap on the screen. Um, free idea for anyone out there. Uh, it'll make you a bunch of money, I promise. Make an air hockey game for the iPad that two people can play both at the same time, moving around their, their little uh, the control to, to hit the puck. Uh, I think that'll be really cool. I would, I would buy it. Uh, and even cooler, I, just, I actually just thought about this last night when I was putting these slides together. But combining multiple iPhones with a single iPad in the middle of a, of a table, for example. Uh, imagine a game of Scrabble, where the iPad is sitting in the middle showing the game board. And each person has, on their iPhone or their iPod Touch, their letters. And they can, they can rearrange that. They've got their private view, but there's also a shared view in the middle. Uh, you could even, I mean, you could get into the really crazy interactions like flicking a piece and it, you know, flips out onto the board. Um, you know, Scrabble is is one example of that. I feel like there's going to be a, a ton of really cool games that could um, go into this sort of heterogeneous uh, mode where there's iPhones interacting with iPads. And then, of course, multiple touches. You know, the the iPhone has always had multiple touches. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but I believe the iPhone has had the ability to track. 10 touches at a time on the screen. The problem is that it's the way the screen is sized, if you're fitting 10 fingers onto the screen, you've really, it's quite an accomplishment. Um, the iPad screen is sized nicely enough that you can actually comfortably fit, you know, uh, for, g given the dimensions of it, it seems possible to fit both of your hands on it, or even multiple people's hands on it. Uh, so two hands, three hands, four hands. Uh, I think this is really cool. It, it kind of brings new meaning to the idea of a keyboard. Uh, there's going to be some great music, uh, artistic creation apps that come out of this thing. Um, you know, Dr. Gawang here at Stanford, the folks at Smule, you've seen what they've done on a device like, like the iPhone. Um, I, I can only imagine what, what sort of cool stuff is going to happen for the iPad, where you could you know, use you know, two hands on it. You could hold it up, use it as an air guitar, or a, you know, a little scratchy, I don't know, some sort of jug band instrument. or I don't even know. It's, but it's really cool. So let's jump into the third part of the lecture. We've talked about um, kind of the, the perspective that I like to think about um, 
the iPad from from a, from a product point of view, and also a little bit about some, some specific use cases where it might be really interesting. Um, and now I'm going to attempt to give you uh, some tips on how one may, might make a great iPad app. This is just my opinion. Uh, couple th th these, these aren't hard and fast rules. They're suggestions that you may wish to follow, which um, I think could be, could be fruitful. Um, the first one, it's not an iPhone. We'll get into these in, in more depth. Uh, the second one is don't break the flow. And the third tip is make it feel real. So let's talk about the first one. It's not an iPhone. Uh, this is the quote I was talking about before. You know, I, every you know tech blog out there was like, it's just a big iPod Touch. Like they, you know, like it was this great insight. Like, oh wow, like we discovered the secret, like failing of the iPad. It's just a big iPod Touch. Um, you know, maybe from a feature checkbox point of view. You know, if you were, if this were a product from another company and it came with a box with a big feature matrix and a bunch of green checkboxes. Yeah, maybe it's, it shares a lot in common with the iPod Touch. Um, but as we've been talking about you know, throughout this lecture, especially in the sort of the settings where this is going to be used, um, it's a different beast altogether. So just as when you were transitioning to the iPhone, and you maybe had a desktop app that you had worked on before, and it would have been a really bad idea to take that app and just kind of like scale it down, squish it all onto the iPhone screen, that was a bad idea. And, uh, the suggested uh, way of, 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 of dealing with that was actually to use multiple screens in your iPad application. Um, along those same lines, don't just take an iPhone app and you know, use those view auto resizing masks, which you all know about because you're taking CS 193P, and just scale it up bigger because it's going to feel really weird. There's going to be a lot of empty space on the screen. Um, it's just going to kind of feel intuitively wrong. Um, so look at, look at the system apps. Um, and think about how you know maybe you can begin to show multiple types of data on the screen at the same time. Um, you know any of these any in these these types of apps that are just scaled up, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb on the App Store um, when when that is made available. Um, they're just going to feel wrong for a device that is sized that feels like an iPad. So this brings us to the second point um, related to the first one, which is don't break the flow. Um, on the iPhone, because it felt weird to squeeze multiple types of views onto the screen, there was this, this, this sort of guideline, this suggestion of just keep one view on the screen at a time. So in an app like, uh, like Address Book, you would have this top level screen, you'd tap to go in another level, uh, tap to edit, you bring up the phone number, and each of these, each of these uh, views is full screen and they're, and they're separate from all the other views. And you're always in one of them at a time. Um, because you've got a little bit more screen real estate to work with, it's possible to avoid breaking a user's flow. Um, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, avoid breaking a user's flow by bringing up some targeted amount of data um, in a smaller part of the screen while leaving the rest of the screen intact. Uh, obviously, you know, yeah, don't, don't abuse it. Just because you can put more than one type of view on the screen at a time doesn't mean you should. Um, popovers, as demonstrated in uh, the keynote, you, you saw them, in, uh, if you go to the Apple website, you watch the keynote video, popovers are, are all over the place. And popovers are great for modal content. In a situation on the iPhone where maybe you would create a new address book contact or create a new, um, or pick a photo from your photo album, that always brought you into a full screen view that was just dedicated to picking that photo. Uh, whereas on the iPad, you see here um, a, a shot of the, uh, the keynote application. And you can bring up some peripheral data without taking over the entire screen. And this allows you to avoid interrupting your user's flow in the application. They don't feel like they've been taken someplace completely different. Um, this data comes up, but they're still where they were beforehand. And they can cancel out of it really quickly. Uh, it's not this multi-step process to navigate back to where you were. So I, th I think effective use of this popover construct is going to be really, really important for making uh, really great iPad apps. Uh, and this leads to another point, which is that full screen transitions, like the, the horizontal sliding of a navigation controller or the vertical sliding um, of a modally presented view controller, that, that feels okay when it's on a pretty small device. If you've got a bigger swath of pixels and all of a sudden the entire screen just flies away and something new comes in, I feel like that's going to be disorienting. Uh, you don't see that very much on your desktop uh, Either I mean, you see some animations, but it's not like the entire screen like whips out of the way. It, it, it's rare when you see that. Um, so keep that in mind. 
Uh, you're not going to be building apps where you just have a single view that full screen transitions to another single view in an iPad application. If you do, it's going to feel really weird. Like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the final sort of guideline or rule is to really try and make it feel real. Uh, direct manipulation, as I was talking about when I was um, you know, bad-mouthing the mouse earlier, is, uh, is, a really, is a really big deal on the iPad. It's so powerful to just be able to allow your user to touch the data that they want to interact with, directly touch it. Um, an app like the Photos app, this is a screenshot from, from Apple.com, um, there's no unnecessary controls, there's no indirection, there's no uh, Chrome, there's no pop-ups, there's no, you know, select your source from this list and this thing over here will change. You're just dealing with your data. It feels tactile, it feels physical. Um, there are a lot of real world attributes that are um, incorporated into these objects that make them just feel like, like real world things that you're touching. Um, so, Tactile, physical interface design. This has been, you know, apps that have embraced this on the iPhone have done really well. Um, apps like Postage, Classics, ConvertBot that, that have this really great, like you just, it, it just feels like something, like a real physical object. Uh, and this is going to be all the more important on a device like the iPad where it's a little bit bigger. And if it just feels like pixels flying around the screen, it, it's, it's going to be missing something important. Um, this leads me to another uh, sub-point here, which is sound design. I don't mean sound like, you know, good, good design. I mean like actual sounds, audio. Uh, subtle, you know, clicks or little just uh, selective usage of sound really helps to make things feel more real when you're using them. Uh, if, you, if you've used apps like ConvertBot or Classics, you know, and, and they have realistic page rustling sounds or uh, like click, 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 click when you spin something around. Uh, that goes a long way toward convincing your user that it feels like a real, uh, convincing your user that it that it's, can be treated like a, a real physical object. Animations. The iPhone is all about animation. I mean, you think about the cell phone that you had before you had an iPhone. If, you, if you're like me, you would press menu and you would navigate through some stuff and every time you would navigate an additional level, the entire screen would just change and the new thing would appear. And this careful use of, of animation to reinforce where you are, where you're going, where you've been. When you zoom in on something or zoom out, to not just have it jarringly click into place, but to actually have a smooth transition uh, is really huge for making user interfaces understandable, for making navigation clear and obvious, for the user to have a mental, to build a mental map of where they are in this space that you've presented to them. Um, so animation is really great for that. It, it helps things, things to feel connected, more whole, more understandable. And it's also, it's fun. You know, I mean, there's, there's animations on, on uh, the iPhone that I just, you know, they don't serve any specific purpose other than to make me smile a little bit when they, when they, when they occur. Uh, or even things like, you know, the, when you're scrolling in a list and you get to the end, it has that rubber band feel. I will just sit there sometimes when I'm bored and I will just scroll that list over and over, let it bounce back, let it bounce back. There's something that's immensely... Uh, satisfying about that sort of a feel in a user interface. And um, that is as, if not more important on a, on a device like, like the iPad. So it's not just eye candy. It, 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 serves, it serves a real purpose. Uh, and sometimes that purpose is fun. A uh, couple specific tips before we, before we wrap things up here. Uh, the first one is to read the human interface guidelines. Uh, I'm not able to say anything more about them because they're covered, on, covered under the, um, the NDA that comes with the, the iPad SDK. Um, suffice to say that human interface guidelines have always been a big part of Mac and iPhone development and they are just as important uh, and useful for designing a great iPad application. So if you sign up, uh, accept all the agreement stuff, that's, this is something that you can download, read, just download it in, into your brain and incorporate it into your thinking because it's really important. Uh, the other tip is to work with a great designer. Um, you know, it's, it's so painful to be using a, a, a really nicely thought out application that, you know, just doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's either got awful visual art or the, or the information design, the navigation is confusing. Finding a great designer who can pair up with your engineering expertise is, is really, really valuable. Um, the way I like to think about this is that four times the pixels means four times the ugly on the screen. If you've got a really just like horrendous app, maybe it looked bad on an iPhone, it's gonna look really, really bad on an iPad. So 
Investing in great visual design, great interaction design, uh, extremely valuable here. So, you know, so, so walk over to the, to the D school or, or find some, uh, some people who are, who, who, someone who's a really great graphic designer, work with them on, on an application. And don't just treat it like something that can be applied really quickly after the fact. It has to be an integral part of, of building an app. Um, the last tip, performance, is a huge deal. Um, I can only imagine that you know, there are going to be some folks who develop iPad apps without actually running them on, on real hardware, and they're going to ship them out there the day that the App Store opens, and these apps are just going to feel slow. Um, one of the biggest, uh, one of the coolest things about the first iPhone when it came out was that the performance was just obsessively tuned. So everything just felt buttery and smooth. And again, it was a huge difference from cell phones that, that I had used in the past. You know, you press a button, and there's just a little, little lag. There's like a three quarters of a second wait for a new screen to come up. And when that, those sorts of uh, delays are eliminated, it's just a huge difference in terms of usability and satisfaction. Um, so really think about performance. When these guys talk about performance, when they talk about threading, tools like Instruments, uh, Shark, you know, all that stuff, you're, you're going to have to really apply it um, thoughtfully to iPad application development as well. Uh, you can't go without it. Oh, one more. Build a paper iPad. There's, you know, if you Google for paper iPad, you can actually print out a life-size iPad to hold in your hand, get a feel for, you know, where your thumbs are going to be on the screen. Um, working, you know, purely on your desktop computer is not going to really get, get the, full, uh, the full feeling across. Um, so just having something you can kick around while we all wait for you know, the day when we line up at the Apple Store and we all buy as many iPads as they will give us. Um, have a little, a little physical object that you can carry around with you. You can carry it with you all day, try to fit it into your back pocket, uh, put it under your pillow, just you know, begin to you know, acclimate to this, this idea of the iPad in your life and where it fits. Uh, a couple of links that I recommend that do uh, a nice job talking about you know, where the iPod fit, iPad fits in, um, you know, sort of dissecting some of the, some of the critiques of the iPad. Uh, some links here, check them out. This will be online like usual, so you, can, uh, you, know, you don't have to madly scribble it down right now. Um, yeah, some really great, great perspectives here. So in summary, uh, if I leave you just remembering one thing, it's that um, new platforms don't come along very often. You know, this, this moment in time where uh, a product like the iPad comes out, um, you, know, you may see this you know, a, a single digit number of times in your career as, as an engineer. Um, it's a really exciting place to be. Um, the possibilities are endless. The landscape is completely wide open. We don't know what kind of apps um, are going to be the real killer apps for this sort of device. Stuff I was mentioning before with like these multi-user interactions, mixing devices together, having really social um, you know, apps that aren't just for one person. I think that's going to be huge, but, but there's going to be all sorts of other stuff that we, we have no way of predicting. Um, so it's a really exciting place to be as a, as a software engineer, as a designer. Um, so really, go forth and develop. You're, you're getting the tools, the knowledge, uh, the know-how that you need from, from Al and Josh uh, here in this class. Um, you know, you may not realize it, but you're, you're becoming trained as an iPad developer just as you're becoming trained as an iPhone developer. So that's really valuable, and I, and I would encourage you to go out there and just, just build some cool stuff. So thank you. Uh, you know, I think, you know, email, it's kind of whatever. Here's my Twitter username if you're into that sort of thing. Um, so thank you for your time. Hope this was useful to you. Apologize for not having any code to show you, but, you know, it's kind of fun to do that sometimes. Uh, yeah, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.